Greetings, esteemed viewers. My name is Samuel David, and I am your host of the Biblia Sophia channel, brought to you by Anathema Publishing. Today's special guest is Balthazar Black. Balthazar is a ceremonial magician, hoodoo practitioner, medium, and has recently released the Divine Gypsy Mother, a divination system. Balthazar, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me on, Samuel. I appreciate it. So you have a complex, interesting background. As I understand it, your grandmother was a spiritualist, and that wove its way into their narrative of your life as someone who also has a Catholic background. You have a hoodoo background. You are a practicing uh, professional magician. So there are so many titles, so many hats that you wear. Uh, how do you manage all of this in your day-to-day -day life? What is what is life like? I, the titles thing, I, I actually always struggle when people, you know, to explain what you, what I do, or what my title is, uh, because my, I feel like my feet is always in two different worlds, you know? So there's, um, you know, one way, you know, I'm a medium. I'm primarily a medium. I think of myself often as just a medium, but I'm also, of course, I'm an occultist and I, I'm a, 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 you know, a, a, a spiritual worker. And um, so my my foot is in these two worlds of, of mediumship and spiritualism. And then of course the occult side, the magical side, uh, and I consult and, and, and do that kind of thing for people. Um, but yeah, indeed, my my grandmother uh, was, as, you know, used to go to the spiritualist church, and uh, as did you know, most of the females in my family. There, there was a lot of matriarchal energy in my family. But my mom and my gran and all my aunts, they used to go to the spiritualist church. And then, but my gran was, you know, she was uh, she was a seeker, and so I grew up with a lot of that kind of thing stories about my messages from my dead grandfather stories about you know apparitions and my my, my grandfather appearing and the different relatives and also with the other aunts and so on this uh th this kind of um uh, presence of the dead in that way was very much part of my upbringing and of course <clears throat> also dreams that my my grand used to really be into dream interpretation and so um uh, and and she, she even though she wasn't a medium strictly speaking she used to do automatic writing she was a member of Amork uh, she, which she was very proud of and she had an Amork membership card and um, uh, quite a, a big library of spiritual books and mainly theosophical books but she had some occult books also and uh, that sort of thing. So that was a strong influence in my upbringing uh, to my father's great discontent, to be honest. Um, but yeah, my gran had a big influence and, and um, much of what I still do to this day in a lot of different ways is really strongly influenced by what I got from her. Um, so yeah, I guess in a way it was natural that I would eventually become a medium training medium should not develop that um and of course then um yeah I, I wouldn't say that hoodoo is part of my background strictly speaking that's something you know i i got trained in later on due to my you know, my um my seeking it out really being becoming interested in that and uh, in, in conjure and 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 more broadly in folk magic you know I'm a, I'm a student of folk magic and of course i'm an occultist i've always been an occultist and quite a precocious, uh, uh, you know, I started young, really young, uh, you know, as so th that's been always been with me. But the 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 conjure that came later on, and I was fortunate to, you know, get some training with some um, notable figures uh, uh, in African American um, uh, folk magic. And but more broadly, you know, I, I'm a student of folk magic in general. And uh, magic of the diaspora, African magic, of course, uh, as you know, as as you, as you see in in Southern Africa, um, the, some of the folk magical traditions there, because you know, of course, even though there are cultural spe specificities in these traditions, folk magic has a universe. There's a universal language 
that you see in folk magic even if if you know even if it's from a really a far flung uh traditional culture you know uh let's say thai magic uh when i was in thailand uh, you know i was i was surprised how the folk magic some of the folk magical uh language there is the same you know there are certain things that are quite consistent across all different human cultures so um yes that that of course informs my work in a big way because um that that is kind of one of my interests the, where um western magical tradition and solomonic magic and uh folk magic uh intersect that sort of in that venn diagram of 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 uh magical work that's kind of my uh, area of interest that i've spent a lot of time working on uh, mainly because it's practical yeah I, I like practical magic i like the stuff that's uh that's um accessible and doable and uh gets results you know and and focuses on things that people care about uh i mean of course i i, I like and i i study um more formal ritualistic styles of solomonic magic and that kind of thing uh, also but uh again it's my 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 feet are always in these two different worlds uh, <laughs> I, I've, and even with my mediumship i'm you know i'm a i'm a, a medium i've been trained uh within the spiritist tradition the afro-cuban and puerto ricans uh spiritism uh, the, uh very extensively got a really good um education and training within that um uh, that school of spiritualism because it's a it's a it's a it's a style of spiritualism as a general movement but i also had some very solid training within anglo spiritualism and the the spiritualist church uh, within the anglo tradition uh, and so in that way i've also got my feet in both these worlds and often the, the these worlds that I choose to get involved in are at odds. You know, the the Anglo spiritualists, when they even hear about spiritism, especially Afro-Cuban spiritism or or uh, anything of Latin American spiritual spiritism, they they say it's voodoo. They get <laughs> they get really uncomfortable about it. So um, uh, you know, my my main mentor knew he kind of knew. You know, uh, I mentioned it. Uh, uh, to him uh, is an elderly a, a, a spiritualist minister in, in his seventies. So he was he was brought up in in that in the spiritualist church in the UK when it was very you know uh, strict. They have a very strict philosophy about what it is and what it isn't. All these things. Right. So they they don't want any of that. And of course they hate occultists too. They, they don't they they don't they don't put any truck on occult you know on on ritual magic. They also think that's uh, 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 you know uh, what else should we say um, uh, corrupt or something uh, of course there's always been <laughs> the this, irony <laughs> there's always been this weird tension between uh, the, the occultism and spiritualists occultists think mm -hmm. spiritualists or mediums are, are hacks or or hucksters or something and and the spiritualists think that this the occultists are up to no good so uh, there's that uh, thing. But yeah, then I have my feet in both these worlds. And um, for me, these two forms of spiritualism uh, in uh, in my own um, work are beautifully complementary. They, they, they overlap really nicely. And just the same way that I find African-American Kanja overlaps very beautifully with Solomonic magic uh, and, and, and um, folk magic, or uh, European folk magic uh, uh, within the grimoire, sort of within that grimoire, tradition mm -hmm. um uh, so I, I like that I, I like finding these where things dovetail and i tend to kind of insert myself in this odd place uh and yeah it doesn't always uh it's not a particularly comfortable thing <laughs> neither side is happy about it <laughs> so here you are um, a man at the veritable crossroads so we should call you <laughs> the man at the crossroads <laughs> yeah yeah the crossroads is a very good <laughs> analogy for what... and of course you know i grew up in south africa uh you know uh, and uh, so i'm a i'm a, a you know i'm a white guy that grew up in africa so there's another uh sort of uh, dichotomy there 
so that's a kind of a theme i think but uh yeah i love it for me it's uh, that's where the interesting stuff happens you know certainly from for, from from what what i enjoy getting involved in and what i enjoy studying and exploring and developing so with regards to aspects of your praxis as you had mentioned you you do have a mediumship praxis how long have you been uh, offering your services as a medium and communing with with uh, spiritual entities or intelligences oh yeah i've been reading um more, i would say more or less yeah full-time as a professional reader and doing con you know doing con consulting as a a, 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 a a sort of a professional spiritual worker and medium for 15 years full time now so it's soon going to be 15 years um uh but it started before that of course but I, as a full time thing yeah I've got 15 years now um and um yeah the medium shop of course has always uh, been part of that it's kind of part of this um style of work that I do so it overlaps uh, with the other work of course most mediums uh whether they're evidential mediums certainly well certainly not evidential mediums don't do spiritual consultations with the aim of doing some sort of practical magical uh, uh, uh services or anything like that for clients that's not normal uh but um within the within the within the spiritist tradition in uh, Afro-Cuban uh, spiritualism and, and and so on. Now that's a more common uh, thing to see as a, a medium work and do that kind of uh, practical consultation work with, with magical services and that. Um, but yeah, I would say uh, for about 15 years now, I've been working that way. And uh, of course, I've kind of also got my own um brand or style or, or, or that i that i give it's it's not exactly you know that's why i'm not, I'm not, I'm not quite comfortable being called a, a root worker even though in a way i am because I, a lot of my work involves root work traditional root work um, um but i don't see myself as being really being um legitimately uh within that culture you know uh I'm kind of uh, a mongrel, yeah, and I'm okay with that. So with regards to your mediumship praxis, have there been any experiences that in in the beginning during your, your development of, of this work, um, of, of your skills, have there been any experiences that could have potentially put you off of exploring this and developing this the skill this ability to serve as a medium yeah i mean there are a lot of things that have happened and continue to happen <laughs> really strange things uh in fact your your um tolerance for the unusual and the the uh you know strange phenomena psychic phenomena and so on in, your, your increases with time um so I, I think I got leveled, uh, used to a high level of weirdness quite early on, even in my childhood, uh, because there was a lot of that happening anyway. Um, but I'm trying to think of later on, yeah, I mean, there have been some really unsettling things like objective voice manifestations where I've heard objective voices um, uh, or um, uh, ecto I've seen ectoplasm appear that sort of thing. That was quite, I did not like the ectoplasm. I admittedly, that is my least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was the ups, mo, 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 most uh, uh, sort of, uh, what's the word, uncanny or mm -hmm. uh, just but, uh, you know, like, just creepy. It was really weird and creepy. Uh, uh, but the, I had some ectoplasmic kind of stuff appear. Um, but that is so unusual and um it really, it's, it sh people shouldn't expect that, you know, right. uh, it is a very unusual for that kind of uh, thing to happen. And um, it, it's not a standard part of mediumship or um, what people can expect in a, in a spiritual uh, essay, a reading or getting a mediumship reading or anything like that. But yeah, there, there definitely has been some weird uh, stuff. Um, whether it's put me off or not, I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't say 
it would really have put me off maybe made me more interested uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know the the objective voice thing that i found uh quite disturbing i've had you know voices manifest uh, uh, uh and th that i find really you know it's quite uh up spooky and genuinely uh unnerving very yeah. very unnerving uh hearing a voice speak to you uh, in, you know in the dark uh, that's quite uh, something i wouldn't um want someone to experience but uh, fortunately it was nothing sinister mm -hmm. the 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 the, 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 the uh, it was a it was a, a very nice message i was given a, it was a very nice a good message from a very helpful spirit guide yeah uh which i knew which i knew about so this wasn't like a haunting or some sort of evil spirit that appeared. <laughs> it was a nice spirit who I knew. I knew I was familiar with this guide. I was comfortable with. I'd been working with this guide for many years, and it had something urgent that it wanted to tell me. And it, it, and obviously the normal media mystic channels hadn't succeeded. So it just this one evening, um, as a, you know, in the dark, it just it just piped up. <laughs> <laughs> from the doorway it was standing right by the doorway and it and it expressed uh or, or, or she expressed herself and um uh it was quite an extraordinary thing i mean it was it's really a really unusual thing for physical phenomena like that because usually with mediumship we if we we might develop clear audience right. where we are hearing voices but they are um, you know, there's the, this is happening as through a, in your mediumship at, within a you know, subjective experience, and true clear audience is also quite rare. You know, most mediums are not truly clear audience, and in fact, it's a very sought after uh, clear. You know, of, the, of all the mediumistic senses, the clear, of the, uh, the uh, or what we call the clairs, the the clear audience is the one that is the most prized, because with clear audience. This, the spirit people will give you names, they will give you numbers, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, 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 I, you know, one clear audience, famous clear audience medium uh, that I've seen do demonstrations, I've seen her give telephone numbers, whole telephone numbers. Wow. Of like a deceased person. Oh, this this is the, the this was their address, and her, their their telephone number was pop 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 pop. Would give the whole telephone number, so that you get with clear audience. And if you've developed, so it's a really an extraordinary gift for you. Even if you're a well-developed medium, that uh, is something that takes a long time to develop, if it ever develops, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, uh, yeah, even that's something. So, but having an objective voice, that's technically, that's part of um, physical mediumship, you know? Mm -hmm. phys and physical mediums will sit in development to develop um, uh, physical medium, uh, mediumistic phenomena for many decades without much success some of them never succeed and it can it's quite a, an ordeal to develop that and certainly something that i wouldn't i wouldn't personally be interested to bother with <laughs> yeah. i'm of the opinion that it's best to develop the or or continue to to strengthens a skill that you already have and if you attempt to develop other skills you know and they don't manifest obviously it's perhaps time to move on to something else i know in my my own experience with with spirits i've never had any full-blown manifestations i haven't had any clear audience experiences to the point where i'm getting some some defined definite message i've you know heard a whisper here and there um one one experience that i did have which still lingers to this day and it was in the presence of others uh we were in a local um there's a a local outreach program that that has been established in a former home for unwed Catholic mothers and there were nuns on staff and perhaps a priest or two, I'm not certain. Uh, but for the longest time, it was a home for unwed Catholic mothers. And since then, you know, of course, it's it's taken on this role as an outreach program for the LGBTQ community and which is which is an interesting intersection there. 
and they often have ghost tours during the Halloween season. And I was there with several individuals and we were given talk boxes, dousing rods, you know, all of the various things that would be used to attempt to communicate or at least put the mind in a state where it would be perceptive to these things. And as we were walking through the house, there was a lull and we decided that it was time to maybe just break up for, for some socialization and not really focus on, on communicating with ghosts. And as I'm sitting in a stairwell talking with some of the friends that were with me, um, suddenly the talk box started repeatedly saying my name, Sam, 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 and everyone stopped and we all looked at each other like, is this really happening? Is this, is this something that, <laughs> that is really wow. happening? So, you know, in instances like that have, have, you know, occurred, but very rarely, usually it's an image of, of a person or, uh, dreams mostly is, is where I get, uh, this information. Uh, one instance, a deceased friend. Uh, communicated to me in a dream and in a series of several dreams it seemed as though they were lingering and so I figured I don't and we had had a falling out prior to their death mm -hmm. so I found that that quite fascinating um, because in these dreams they were asking for food they were asking for something to drink which is typical of of spirits that interact with us and at one point I decided there's probably some unresolved business between the two of us. So I performed a ritual. I presented uh, food and, and a drink and, you know, spoke my piece. And that night I went to bed and I was still awake and, you know, just thinking about the ritual, thinking about, you know, everything that had transpired to that point. And in the dark, I felt a hand on my arm slowly go from my elbow to my wrist, just raising my arm. And then it was gone. There was no more sensation of a presence in the room with me. And those dreams involving that friend have ceased. So wow, that's, that's one of my, my many treasured experiences when it comes to interacting uh with with the dead or spirits in general so beautiful yeah it's amazing how the spirit people uh try to reach us and um and you know of course if someone is an is more receptive they will definitely seek you out and try and uh, get what they need through you know mm -hmm. so that's really amazing uh but it reminds me of a story of this is one of the the the, the sort of famous family stories that I was often told, uh, also a, touch, a, a ghost touch story. When my uh, my grandfather he had lost his finger in he in an engineering accident, so he only had like you know he had like a little stub mm -hmm. finger, and then when he when he passed away, um, he, he he you know after after his death like the same night he appeared beside my mom's bed but I was sleeping on the floor. Uh, she made like a temporary bed there from because they were, she was staying with my grandmother. And so he appeared standing over, over me. And then she, she got a fight and she says, don't stand on the, don't stand on the baby. Don't stand on the baby. But she hadn't quite clocked that he was obviously dead. Yeah. <laughs> she thought it was really him. Yeah. And then he, t then he vanished and then she realized, Oh, uh, you know, he's dead. It, it couldn't be him. And then later that evening, she heard him say, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry, worry. And she, he was he was touching her, he was patting her like that. And she knew it was him because he, she could feel the the missing uh, finger. Wow. You know, the, 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 the stub, because he had the, the way his hand touched had that sort of uh, nubbly bit, you know what I mean? <laughs> so that was one of the, and I heard that story repeated like, I, endlessly you know whenever the, the 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 spirit stories would start this would be the first one to be told uh, uh so but also an interesting physical phenomenon which is quite characteristic um I, I a lot of people actually have them around certainly around the time of death you know mm -hmm. 
It's interesting, you know, physical mediums will will spend many decades trying to really uh, produce physical phenomena like this. And it's a quite a distinct track of mediumistic development, certainly within the Anglo spiritualist uh, tradition. You know, most mediums develop as mental mediums or active mediums, but you get also you get trance mediums who sort of specialize in being trance mediums and incorporating spirits. And of course, you get uh, mediums who are either, uh, you know, they're working in with other modalities like uh, automatic writing or something, although that's busy dying out. Um, but uh, then, then there is this this um, very small uh, group of physical mediums who, who, you know, they will sit in circle for, you know, decades sometimes uh, just trying to produce physical phenomena. And it takes a long time. It takes like, literally like a decade. And then eventually um, chairs will begin to levitate. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, you know, they have this trumpet that the, the trumpet will raise and voices or physical, you know, uh, objective voice uh, will begin to manifest through the trumpet so uh uh yeah it's a it's a uh and and also i think it's an area of uh, mediumship that's busy fading yeah because people don't have the patience for de de developing that are anecdotally are you familiar with the philip experiment I've, no i'm not I, i've not heard of that so there was an experiment involving a group of parapsychologists in the 70s that uh, were in Toronto, I believe, and they were attempting to essentially manifest phenomena by interacting with a fictional ghost, but they had created this, uh, this elaborate biography, they created um, this they they drew images of this this individual that they named Philip, um, and I was I was just reminded how in many of these instances you know there is that potential overlap where what we perceive to be a human spirit could potentially be an egregore of sorts or or uh, a tulpa a thought form of sorts. Have you had any experiences with? Uh, entities or spiritual intelligences of that manner. Yeah, I mean, um, well, good mediums will have developed in such a way that they will not interact with those. Uh, and well, one reason is that a, 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 a well-developed medium will, is usually working with a, a, a team of spirit helpers, guides, or controls. They're acting as like gatekeepers and and they're intermediary spirits that are Kind of doing traffic control on the on the spirit people. So, certainly, a working medium who's doing a lot of evidential work in that has has developed his um, his team, his guides. You know this framework around him in a, such a way that that gets taken out of the mix. You don't get so much of that. Or if it if it comes in, you're just made aware of that it is a thing that is there, but it is you know it's not. Um, yeah, it's not an, a problem or uh, something that would really intrude. Yeah. So, um, you know, that would be my take on it. Uh, but uh, certainly, you know, um, other spiritual kind of creatures, you know, those can also be, of course, because people are, have relationships with other kinds of spiritual beings. Right. Um, so you can often, you can often see those, uh, those threads within a person's spiritual framework, you can sort of detect that presence. Oh, that that this person is working with some sort of, uh, you know, maybe a Greco-Egyptian uh, being, or one is working with something that's maybe for, um, a Brazilian, some sort of um, some something from Brazil. Uh, you can kind of detect those frames, uh, those flavors within their framework, but. Um, uh, that it it shouldn't from the point of view of 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 it being a practical thing in a in a mediumistic session, um, um you know a good medium will be able to um yeah to deal with that in a constructive way so that it's not an interference or something like that. Um,
Yeah. Does that make sense? Does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially, your spirit guides, for those who are not familiar with uh, with these types of, of uh, dynamics, you have these mutually beneficial spirits that you work with, and they essentially serve as referees, you know, allowing the transmission, if you will, to come through. So it sounds as though these types of spirits would be just uh, interference on, on a radio frequency that just tend to get filtered out while the actual spirit that you are attempting to communicate with has a clear transmission, is able to you know interact with you as the medium and interact or or be able to navigate those channels with those uh, those spirits that have uh, come into relationship with you as guides. Yeah, well put. Yeah, very well put. Yeah, I mean it's it, you know uh, spiritualism and spiritism are really twentieth uh, century phenomena. Uh, that so it's a it's a, a kind of a revival of something. But the the use of the guide or the intermediary spirit is a really ancient thing that you mm -hmm. see in in many 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 uh spirit systems of spirit work that where you know the shaman or the whatever it is whatever um uh, spirit worker it will have a familiar or some sort of intermediary being that is their uh their fixer you know that's mm -hmm. the contact for the spirit world and is as acting as this go between and that's kind of the hallmark of a professional you know that he will have developed that well you know and that right. relationship is kind of your so you know uh, espiritistas and and of course um and even you know anglo mediums they you know they really work on developing that relationship um and that you know that's one of the main uh, sort of um uh, all, uh and and a very important thing to keep in mind when when working with the dead i would mm -hmm. say um and also uh, just as a uh, to deal also they help you to deal with the information that you receive right. um so for example i recently did an evidential sitting for a client and um the 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 communicator you know the spirit person this relative had died of extremely grisly grisly death like truly grisly and upsetting and uh, even so i found it quite upsetting and disturbing because, uh, but thankfully that sort of gets toned down or, you know, it gets, it gets filtered somewhat so that mm -hmm. it's more tolerable that you don't, it's not a, a corrosive uh, thing because you might experience that trauma or you might feel ill or something. You, you, yeah. you, you don't want that stuff. Um, and, but, but for me, you know, even though spiritualism and spiritism is, is such a, you know, very much a 20th century thing, really uh, it, it has all the hallmarks of the spirit work as you see it in Africa or uh, where, wherever the case may be, which is the reason that it became so closely syncretized with uh, African and, and uh, uh, African adjacent traditions mm -hmm. within Latin America, uh, and even displacing some of the traditional ancestral ancestor veneration, but working with the things, working with the dead, some of those cults, that you know that did in fact transfer to say places like Cuba, kind of fell more into um, uh, disuse uh, in, in with with spiritism being favored because it was a, a somehow an easier, more efficient way of doing the same thing. Uh, even though it is a, a, a you know a twentieth century uh, phenomena, really. Mm -hmm. So given your your various experiences. Uh, one of the topics that I found uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, you had actually touched on in um, in one of your videos, and uh, that was your immersion into uh, Thai culture, where you received the Sakyant uh, tattoo. Hey. I'm back from Thailand and I'm well rested and I'm slightly tanned and I'm feeling good and as promised uh, I went through the Sakyant experience. 
for those that don't know, a Sakyant tattoo is a sacred talismanic tattoo within the Thai magical tradition, which kind of um, has animistic, uh, tantric, Buddhist kind of um, uh, interweaving of elements. So it's a, it's a, ma it's a magical art, um, ta talismanic tattoo art, um, that has uh, that, that makes use of these yants, which are uh, yantras or magical designs, which are tattooed on to the bodies of recipients for various um, uh, reasons, magical reasons, uh, such as spiritual protection or protection from enemies, or bullets and gunfire and, and knives and so on. Often soldiers and policemen and so on in, in the in the Thai military. Um, would receive these and also for many many other reasons spiritual evolution good luck good fortune and so on and um, this the art of this tra tradition is transmitted within a lineage um, of masters um, so this is should be done by a qualified master of the tradition and I was very lucky to have mine done by someone called Ajahn Neng who is a very famous Sakyant tattoo master and very famous throughout Southeast Asia um, for the power and uh, for the beauty of his, of his Sakyant tattoos um, and uh, that's an important point to make here you can, if you travel to Thailand there are many many tattoo shops um, for that cater to the tourist industry and many of them will have um, Sakyant designs on the wall and I, I'm, I'm sure the tattoo artists they would be happy to to uh, tattoo you with those designs um, but those wouldn't be an authentic Sakyant talismanic tattoo with the magical power um, because that's done within the confines of the tradition by one of these masters and typically they are ordained and they've been trained with the, the, with the secrets of this tradition that make these uh, these tattoos powerful and effective for this uh, use. Sometimes they're Buddhist monks, um, sometimes they have another kind of ordination um, which is kind of a yogic, um, uh, gives them yogic powers and so on. So it, it really is a, a, an art that's imbued with the, the force of this lineage and the power of this tradition, the weight of this tradition that gives it this potency and this force. Um, and I was felt really lucky to be able to participate in this and to receive the 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 the, the blessing of this uh, of this uh, tattoo's magical power. If you will indulge me and perhaps some of the viewers and listeners, um, what are your thoughts on the separation between the the spirit world and those of us who live in the quote unquote industrialized Western world. Do you feel that there is a distinct break between the two that has um, had a negative effect, if you will, on our Western society? Uh, this is one of the reasons that I love the work that I do and that I, why I feel it's so important, not my work specifically, but I mean the work of you know uh, of uh, mediumship and and um, um, you know any any kind of magical modality or anything where 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 um, um, you know re-enchanting the world yeah mm -hmm. I think is so is so vital because it addresses you know it uh, what is really the central sickness within our culture and within our western sort of uh you, you know w w the the decline of our our civilization i would mm -hmm. argue uh so um and you can definitely see that when you're in thailand because thailand yeah. a they were never colonized yeah this is one of the extraordinary things about thailand there was no no uh, colonization i can't remember exactly the reason for that but they've always you know been a sovereign state and so they're they're uh of course they're buddhist and they also have sort of an indigenous um uh, syncretized uh, mm -hmm. shamanistic thing that's latent there um but the, that um sort of numinous vision of the world and their their relationship to the transcendent and the spirit world is perfectly intact even though they're also a mo they're quite a modern you know, westernized. If you go to Bangkok, it looks a bit like Blade Runner, you know. It's yeah. Like, it's quite <laughs> sci-fi in some way. It's cool. It's very cool. 
but uh, the in another way, it's still a very in a traditional culture and a magical culture. You know, you can go to the magic market there. When I was there, I had a whale of a time. I kept going back to the magic market and looking <laughs> at all the, the the talismans and like they've got the wildest stuff. It was like the the witchcraft there is is really something. And of course, um, yeah, they have these magical tattoos, the sakyants. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's this, the fact that their world hasn't been disenchanted, you know? Mm. Um, and uh, so there's this, this rift in their psyche is, well, they don't have it. You know, the Westerners have this, this weird, this severance in their psyche from the spirit world uh, and, the, and, the, and the divine, you know, however you conceive of that. Mm -hmm. And when you're somewhere like Thailand, you see how what it is like to for things to be another way, um, for, for, and it has got I guess a downside too, in that there's more superstition yeah. also that goes with that and with the dark sides of superstitious stuff, uh, which can also have, have its bad um, uh, outcomes. But I mean, for instance, if you go anywhere in Thailand, uh, every Every house, every property, I, I love this. I have so many, I took so many pictures of this. They have these little spirit houses that they that they build in front of each, every single development house. It doesn't matter if, what it is. If it, if it was dug in the ground, they build a spirit house. Mm -hmm. And they, the spirits that live there, they move into the house. Yeah, they get a, they get a monk who specializes in this kind of um parlaying and divination of what they need and they divine what these spirits need and then they put them in the house so that they don't bother them yeah they don't interfere with whatever you know and then they're happy in the house and they have their own little things that they need and they they give them all they give them drinks mm -hmm. they give them food uh and you'll and, and i i found these little spirit houses so fascinating what the different things that they have you know the uh, one i saw had a had a hairbrush <laughs> and, and a toothbrush in there i was like oh this spirit needs to have, brush his teeth yeah. <laughs> you know? i mean i love that stuff and um and of course they become guardians you know these these you yeah. know so there's this ecology between uh but this it's real it's very real and another thing that i, I found another uh sort of similar spirit shrine that i found was for a deva which was for a, a nature spirit mm -hmm. I lived in a tree uh, with, and was near some national na na natural park, uh, um, very beautiful. And there was a temple there nearby as well, but there was a very nice tree and there was a nature spirit that lived in this tree. And there were all these dresses that the locals would bring that they had bought the spirit, like a pretty dress, you know, that, that a nice lady might wear. And they would tie it to the tree, obviously. And there was incense and they, obviously the spirit had given them something or there was payment for or the, but there were all these dresses that had been sort of were they life size dresses or were they yeah, dresses cool, dull nice, size? Nice dresses, wow. like, nice black ball gowns, silk, very like really nice Ugh, stuff. I love it. And we were it. given to this 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 deva. And, and first I, and then our guide explained, no, there's this this nature spirit and and she takes, you know, she if you ask her for things, she will she will grant your wish and then people will give her these gifts. Uh so it's everywhere, you know, it's just, it's, that's, it. that's, that's, you know, that's how they look at life. And it's just part of, it's just part of their normal uh, experience of the world. And, and I mean, this might just be the Thai, Thai people are of course, lovely people and really nice, but they really do feel much more uh, sane. You know, they, they feel sane to me. I don't mm -hmm. know, I, I, they, they don't seem as neurotic. Yeah. The, mm. they seem really like grounded and sane and, and 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 content and very they've got a lot of dignity as well maybe because they were never colonized you know so they, they never lost that yeah problem. there's no no cultural wound that that has affected them as a yeah. people yeah 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 uh, and um they venerate of course the the monarchy like deities you must that's one of the first things you learn when you get there you should never say anything bad about the time yes <laughs> <laughs> the entire monarch is very bad you get into trouble uh so yeah but a, a really uh, beautiful uh, in that way and then of course with the sakyant I, I was lucky to um uh, there's a famous time uh, master that does that there 
and I was lucky to get him to do that uh, tattoo, which was of course a very also a very interesting thing. Uh, you you have to push the offerings at the shrine with all his spirits, and it's very it, it's not. I mean, it's sort of is Buddhist in a way, mm -hmm. but if you see the shrine, you realize mm, these are you know it's these are you know he's got familiars. Yeah. <laughs> these, are, these are his familiars. And uh, so that was, yeah, that was really uh, quite special too. Uh, uh, and um, uh, there was a, a long line of people, like just hundreds of people waiting for these tattoos. So they and they come from all over that part of um, the world. Very, very interesting process. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got to have that experience. One of the things that I found fascinating about that is, and this is a subject that, that I've discussed uh, with an earlier guest on this channel, and it was the um, the violent divine. And it seems as though aspects of the Sakyant ter uh, uh, ritual, the, the uh, preparation leading up to that point, essentially puts you in that mindset to where you can accept what is happening and it lead, or it leads to this transcendent or almost transcendent state because of the grueling process that the body is going through when it comes to you know the the tattoo itself and and the uh the purpose of the tattoo um that's a tangential thought but one thing that that you you reminded me of as we were talking about your experience in Thailand is the importance of a spirit model and um that's something that or at least that's something that I intuited in our conversation um do you perhaps think that the psychological or or humanist model when approaching an esoteric praxis or any sort of even uh, divination system, do you think that that has a detriment on the efficacy of a medium's work, a magician's work, uh, a practitioner at all? Yeah, I, I, my opinion on this is probably going to be quite uh, controversial. I don't know. Well, <laughs> I love courting I'm, controversy. I'm opinionated about it. Let's so say. am I. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> but, let's court then, controversy and get canceled in yes, the comments. <laughs> I find it far more trustworthy than something cooked up by Freud and sort of. Some, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, Freud. <laughs> uh, I mean, Jung, I think, did his best to reconcile these things, but mm -hmm. he ended up with magic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And interestingly <laughs> enough, all of Jung's work has been integral in informing so uh so many rich uh traditions or at least modern traditions in terms of of pursuing an esoteric current or informing your your spirituality if you will let's change track here you have a uh you know you have a a penchant for for mediumship and and you know esoteric work and you have also contributed to um, publications through Hadean Press, and you are um, one of the authors with Scarlet Imprint, and your recent magnum opus, The Gypsy Mother, uh, Divine Gypsy Mother, was released. And, you know, looking at these beautiful cards, I cannot help but wonder what was the development process behind all of this? What was the impetus that that pushed you to to go this route? Uh, Divine Gypsy Mother is a, isn't a new system that I've developed, um, and it's not based on the Lenormand. It is a, 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 the, sort of the original Sibylla. And there are these oracle decks, European oracle decks that we see appear around the 1800s in Europe at the same time as the Lenormand. It's kind of, you know, it's within that same window. So it's a cousin, yeah. Uh, and these all sort of um, arise out of the German playing card tradition. The Germans had really beautiful illustrated playing cards 
and they, they had, they, it was big business uh, uh, because the printing press, press had been invented in Germany. Right. And so they had lots of really nice playing cards and often very beautifully illustrated playing cards with like animals and, and trees and plants. And so that was big business in a way. And then, um, of course, because people tend to do uh, read playing cards uh, for 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 uh, fortune telling and divination and that, um, uh, th there was a contingent of that uh, a market for that. And so the Lenormand and the 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 Gypsy cards, which the, the Divine Gypsy Mother is a reboot of the Gypsy cards or reimagining of the Gypsy cards, um, sort of were created at that time during the 1800s in Germany and Austria, sort of roughly speaking. So um, the Divine Gypsy Mother is is the that original 32 card and 36 card uh, system called the Sugerner Karten in Dutch, and it's also in German, it's called the Sugerner. Uh, and we've created new art for it, and sort of uh, 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 and it's, and I expanded the iconography somewhat. Uh, and one of the reasons for this was, in fact, my mediumship. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, within mediumship, we've discussed the guides. And one of my important guides is a, a, a what's called a gitana. It's a it's a it's a gypsy, yeah, or a, a traveling person. And um, so I started reading with the gypsy cards. And it struck me that none of the traditional sets that you can buy, even the sort of more, more modern versions that Piatnik sell, you know, they none of them have depictions of traveling people. And even though that it's been called, they've been called the gypsy cards since the beginning, since the, the first their first uh, re reproductions were made. And um, so I thought, oh, how, how cool would it be to create a deck that featured traveling people as protagonists, you know, have them in the cards and, and, and uh, added significators for them. And so this was one of the um, inspirations behind it. Yeah, uh, really as a love letter to my gitana, to my, my gypsy spirit guide and, and to have this um, new version of the deck. And of course, I loved reading with the deck. I was a fan of, of the cards and the, 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 the gypsy cards are kind of the root Sibylla. There was a, there's a genre of these oracle decks called Sibylas, and you get different versions of them. Some are 36 cards, some are uh, 52 cards. Some are, are there's a there's a Italian version called the Vera Sibylla, which I forget how many cards. I think it's also 52 cards. They and the, the there are you know there's a, quite a variety of them, sort of that offshoots of them, but the the gypsy cards are kind of the and the original set, you know, they were the the the, the first um, series of this, mm -hmm. and then and then there were all these variants that where they added more cards to the to the pack, um, and they are they're popular uh, and they have been popular in Germany and uh, the Netherlands and and um, Eastern Europe since the beginning, and they've also had a presence in the English speaking world uh, since the. In, in, uh, first reproduction started coming out because you can see they have titles in English on those cards already. Yes. Um, so that was kind of the inspiration behind the deck. And then I was a big fan of Alexander Danilov's art and, and uh, Alexander and I had been in, um, in contact uh, for a while already. Uh, and I, I pitched this idea to him, would he work with me on this deck? And he really liked the concept. So we, 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 we went ahead and we did it. And the rest is history, as they say. So, uh, uh, but it, it was a really a love letter to my spirit guide in some ways, uh, and to to you know materialize her presence more in this uh, oracle system, which I felt uh, that she used, she well, she still now guides me when I do my readings with these cards. Alexander, of course, th he's he's really a fantastic illustrator. He's he, he's a tarot artist, so he's got a lot of tarot decks of his own that are really very iconic and exquisite. And uh, he, yeah, he, does, he just really has, has any, the, what's great about him, him is he understands divination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we could, when we worked on this project together, he really clocked the, what we were trying to do. And, you know, in a lot of cases, 
uh, you know, some of the cards we were able to expand because I, because I couldn't resist, you know, I wanted to add my own little twist and give a little, just expand it. But staying <laughs> true to the essence of the, of the gypsy cards, I wanted to keep the core there, but uh, cards like constancy, which traditionally just showed the eye of Providence, there was no mm -hmm. other iconography on there. It was just the eye. Um, so I, we expanded and we added more iconography to reflect some of the traditional meanings of that card. Uh, and, and we did on a, quite a few cards, uh, and so and and he was really um, so you know uh, helpful in that process because he understands what what a fortune telling card is supposed to do, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, so that was really cool. And of course, he's just a, he's he's a, his art is is, is very um, beautiful and 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 full of soul. So as we come to the close of our interview i was wondering if perhaps you could share some words of wisdom some parting words of wisdom with our viewers and listeners let's see well when it comes to the gypsy cards i'll give some uh, some wisdom about that uh, uh and what i would say is uh, when reading with them i i've written this big you know book and i give lots of traditional techniques and i i, I really because i'm a big nerd i gave all kinds of um, clever little tricks for finding lost objects and astrological spreads and I really I really geeked out on the whole thing but what I would say <laughs> I couldn't people, tell at all <laughs> <laughs> but what I would say to people is that you know the the the, the gypsy cards are are really very self-explanatory and they they're in fact easier to read the, the Lenormand or the tarot um uh, in that, you know, you, you really, if you, you can look at a card and read the title and you'll get a clear understanding of what that card means. And then if you lay out down three cards, you're going to get a very simple message there off the bat. And the simplicity is really the, the key to understanding the gypsy cards, even though you can read with them in a more um, complicated way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've given lots of techniques for that. Uh, the essence of it is simple and try to keep that intact yeah uh when you work with them you know if you if you get a simple uh sort of hit when you read the cards usually that simple hit that you're getting is usually true that's probably what you should stick with and you'll find that it's when you complicate things that it goes a bit off track and becomes less um accurate in terms of the of the uh, result with the reading of the, of the accuracy of the reading so you know keep it simple and then you can layer on the complex stuff that i include uh, in the book yeah and it is an intuitive process and of course the the, the cards are dedicated to this this the um the the gypsy spirits yeah and and you will find of course when you work with a spiritual guide or you have sort of an additional bit of guidance there to help your intuition it will just enliven your capacity to to read accurately because um some people you know the, there is the assumption that with any card uh, uh card system whether it's a tarot or whatever you're using playing cards or um the lenormand there is some sense uh, there is a, a, an assumption that um the cards will that you draw will be valid yeah and the the truth is that's not always the case not with every person um some in the sense that um uh, one reader might not have the the spiritual contact or the power let's say to draw the right cards yeah because the cards that come out of course are significant if you have a bad card in the outcome um, that the, the having it there in the outcome means something. Uh, it, it's not a, a random thing. It doesn't just land there. It's some some power, some force, some mechanism put it there, mm -hmm. so that 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 would be an accurate thing, right? And th that principle, making sure that the accuracy on that level, you know, making sure that which the cards that come out are the right cards, that really is something that you develop with these spiritual contacts i would argue yeah and even readers don't that uh, good readers that don't know that they have those spiritual contacts have those contacts i would argue yeah in other words i'm saying people have spirit guides whether they like it or not <laughs> <laughs> and 
good readers will have you know spirit guides working with them and help, helping them well, however you conceive of what that spirit guide may be so that to me is really a big ingredient in success with card reading or any system of divination is you need that 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 spirit power yeah uh it's that that's part of the mechanical magic that's happening it is and i feel like people take it for granted that mm. that that the right cards are just going to come out yeah and of course if you've had a bad reading with someone you know or not a bad reading but a reading that was wrong uh you you will know that some people either they don't they're not drawing the right cards does that make sense am i yeah. making sense? yeah you know absolutely. what i'm getting at yeah i'm uh, picking up what you're putting down <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a case of being a, 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 with card reading certainly it's not just a case of you know being psychic or something you're you're doing something that is reliant on this objective experience of the cards on the table and those cards the order of that the way they fall means something it's significant and the how that happens this is really determined by this numinous contact mm. yeah and if the numinous contact is there, then you will be a better reader. Yes. Right? So that to me is a, the, a, a missing component. And this is something that I don't put in the book, obviously, uh, because it's not about that. The book is about the cards. But what I would say is if you really want to improve your card reading ability or your div or divination in any system, then developing spiritual contacts that are really about that is going to augment your ability to be a good reader uh, you know, by a lot. Yes. And, uh, I think people sometimes are not aware of that. Certainly within the, in the, within the general uh, sort of card reading divination landscape, I, I don't know that it gets enough airtime at least. Yeah. I would agree. Uh, so it's maybe because of a diet in the world spiritist. And so I tend to view everything through this, uh, lens rather than a psychological lens mm -hmm. but um uh th yeah that would be my little bit of wisdom excellent with regards to the many services that you offer uh, how can people get in touch with you if if they wish to um acquire any of the services that you offer such as your candle ministry your medium work etc oh yeah yeah they're welcome to check out balthazarkanja.com um yeah that's the best place and of course i've got my youtube channel balthazar uh or balthazar kanja if you put balthazar kanja and you'll get you'll see my youtube channel uh those would be the main places um to find me really i've got my discord people are welcome to check out my discord nice little discord where we talk about um, folk magic mediumship uh solomonic magic that kind of stuff uh, and, uh yeah uh, people are welcome to check out uh my my web presence uh, <laughs> as it is well i will certainly put the applicable links in the show notes below and i once again want to thank you so much for carving time out of your busy day yeah thank you for having me on samuel i appreciate it i had a great time if you're a new viewer and would like to stay up to date with the latest from biblio sophia be sure to like subscribe and turn on notifications for our channel